and it, it is a great uh, meeting. I'm sure that, that you will enjoy the whole meeting. So my, my talk today is about uh, machine learning needs and trends for single particle analysis. And I like to start by presenting how the raw data looks like. So uh, when you look at the frames, the signal to noise ratio is in the order of one over a thousand, meaning that you have a thousand times more noise than signal. And then when you compute your microbats, you uh, go up to uh, one over a hundred, that is a bit better, but still the particles are barely visible there. And from these very noisy data, you want to come out with atomic structures and very precise measurements. So uh, this part of the protein is moving 9.40 degrees in this direction. And so it is a very challenging problem because you are starting with very extremely noisy uh, uh, raw data. So uh, the talk I'm giving today is coming from, uh, it's an excerpt of four papers. So this is the first one that compares mostly classical image processing algorithms with uh, deep learning. Then this one where I make a review of the uh, of number of methods. And uh, what we show there is that single particles is really, really full in methods. So it is not only just the standard ones that we typically apply all the time. And then uh, the main topic of the, of the talk today, that is uh, a discussion of, uh, at the end, you have to estimate many parameters along the path. And you uh, uh, may commit some bias and some variance, and this will translate into uh, wrong structures. And then uh, the second big part is, is this one, how to make sure that what you are measuring is at least consistent and doesn't have any uh, pathological issue in your structure. So uh, regarding the machine learning, so I think that the most general formulation that we can have for machine learning is this one, that is the Bayesian formulation. And here in this formulation, the F are the probability density functions, and then Y are observations, Y not are the models. And once you specify um, a distribution for the noise that typically we take Gaussian noise, and a statistical prior on the parameters, then you can to this kind of uh, other formulation. So rather than maximizing the likelihood of observing your data, you have uh, the uh, minimization of some consistency uh, uh, term. So the consistency with your measurements and then some regularization. And this regularization is coming from the statistical prior. So the role of X and Y, so here X is, is some kind of predictor that predicts your measurements. And, and why are played by different elements depending on what is your problem. We will see a few examples in the next slide. So deep learning in this setup, in this picture, is simply a sophisticated F. So it is just this F that is rather sophisticated. But otherwise, the, uh, the, loop, the, the classical image processing uh, formulation and the deep learning formulation are rather similar. So depends on what is your problem. So for instance, for movie alignment, the X, that is the input to the algorithm, are the frames, and the Y, that is the output of the algorithm, are, are the micrograms. And then the, the theta parameters, these ones here defining your function, are the alignment parameters, so how much each frame is moving with respect to the rest. If you are determining the CTF, then the Y is the power spectrum, uh, the power spectrum density, X is white noise, and then the theta are the microscope parameters. For particle picking, Y is whether a coordinate in a micrograph is the center of the particle. It is a binary discrete output that takes the value two or false. Then X is a micrograph and theta is a picking model. So depending on what is the problem that you are looking at, uh, you X and Y and F will be different, but the setup is almost all the time the same. And this is a, a different view of uh, the same process by two uh, different families of algorithms. So this is the projection expressed in the more classical image processing, while this is the projection expressed by a, a neural network. And you let the network to learn how to project a, a map that even doesn't exist physically anywhere. So uh, these two approaches can be uh, rather different in uh, what uh, how they uh, achieve the things. But 
uh, it, they are very similar in what they want to achieve. Actually, I, I like to think in this way. So we have a problem to solve that is all from the raw data, these frames to the three uh, D structures that we are interested in. Uh, and um, I don't care if a cat is white or black, as long as it can catch mice, it is a good cat. So I don't care if you use classical image processing or you use deep learning. What, what I care is that uh, we can solve these structures. And in any of the two setups, you will have to estimate parameters. So the parameters for the more uh, classical image processing are the uh, alignment parameters, the displacement between two sheets, uh, two frames or whatever, while for the neural network are the weights of the neural network. And, and uh, if you make a, a good uh, estimate of your, uh, of your parameters, you would get the ideal reconstruction. And what you will actually get is the ideal reconstruction plus some perturbation. And this perturbation comes from the errors that you have made along your pipeline. And there are two different kinds of errors. So one kind of errors are centered around the two values. So let's say that uh, there is a, a particular particle has a, 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 an in its own orientation with respect to a volume. Then you estimate that orientation, you make a small mistake. It is randomly distributed around the ground truth and then if you repeat the process of uh, estimating that orientation once and, and again, and you average all those estimates, you would have a, a very good estimate of what is the true underlying uh, orientation. The other kind of errors is that you make big mistakes. And again, you have fluctuations around your estimation, but uh, no matter how many uh, times you average, you, you will get an, a wrong estimate because the, the separation between uh, your uh, estimate and the ground truth is too, is too large. So uh, these, these ones, the small errors or random errors with, uh, zero, uh, with zero mean, they are uh, causing variance in your estimate, while the big errors uh, are causing a bias. And, and the reconstructed map will be a mixture between the, the fraction of correctly estimated parameters that are given a more or less correct structure, plus uh, 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 the fraction of incorrectly estimated parameters that are given a completely incorrect structure. And your reconstructed map will be a combination between the two. So we, when we think of overfitting, uh, we tend to think in this way, that we have too many parameters and then we can adapt to the noise. Actually, uh, if we measure how many uh, observations we have per parameter in Cryon, uh, we have something like 6,000 measurements per parameter. So we have way too many uh, uh, measurements per parameter. So we are not in this regime of fitting models. We are rather more in, in this other, other regime where we have many more measurements than uh, than uh, parameters. And then what we see when we say this, mo this map is overfitted, actually what we mean is that there is a bias in, in, in this structure that is causing these artifacts to be around. And here are a few examples of uh, the kind of errors that you can make uh, when estimating parameters. So when you are aligning the frames, you may, depending on the parameters of the, of the algorithm that you are using, you may end up with this kind of trajectories between frames. And this is just the global trajectory between one frame and the next, not the local ones, or this one. And the, the difference between these two uh, is simply just one of the parameters of your algorithm. So just using the default parameters is fine. Most of the time they do a correct uh, job, but you don't know if you run it only once, you don't know in which situation you are. So the only way to know if you have made a mistake is to run it, uh, to, to try to solve the same problem, to try to estimate the same parameters with some other mathematics, some other algorithm, and compare the two results and see if they agree with each other. And this also affects the, the, uh, the appearance of the images, so the contrast and the granularity of these images are different depending on the alignment algorithm. 
and and also the power spectra can be different and and it is not any particular criticism to motion core two in this case that is giving some kind of artifact at a high frequency it is only that if you cannot compare to anything else you are bound to believe whatever the algorithm whichever it is is telling you the same can happen in uh, when you are estimating the defocus so uh, this is a, a, a typical defocus result that you get and it looks good but you see that the, the theoretical rings match more or less the, the uh, experimental ones but simply judging by eye is not enough so when you make a reconstruction with a, a standard uh, city of the uh, estimation uh, um, this is what you may get so you uh, see here an alpha helix but you don't see the, the details this only when you Try when well, you compare the defocus computed by three different algorithms: uh, GCDF, CTF fine, and XMIP CDF. And and you uh, force them. You only take those parameters, CTF parameters, such that the CTF agrees up to 2.1 astro. That you see the, the small details of your structure. So even if they look by eye decent here, the, the, the small differences in in the defocus can make that. Uh, some of the structures are polar. And the difference between what you get and what you should have gotten is the, is the bias, the diff, this, uh, this uh, perturbation that you get on top of the underlying ideal reconstruction. Uh, the same may happen with uh, when you are picking particles. So uh, here your parameter is whether each one of these pixels is, is the center of a, of a particle. And it, you see that uh, many of them are uh, this, and this is a reasonable uh, picking algorithm, but still you see that there are many mistakes. So there are particles in the carbonate, there are particles here in the aperture, uh, the, this micrograss have a, a problem with the aperture. And there are many good things, but also a fraction of them that are incorrect. And if you just put everything into the reconstruction algorithm, the reconstruction will try to satisfy also these images, so they will be causing a bias. And then when you uh, uh, require the coordinates to be consistently found by different algorithms, and you use multiple pickers, use uh, more sophisticated stuff like deep consensus, micrograph cleaner, these two are based on, on neural networks, and you, you get something much better, so you don't get as many particles, you go from 1.2 million to uh, 600,000. Um, but still, you see that there are still some problems that have ex escaped all these multiple pickers, all the deep consensus thing. So uh, still, these are kind of uh, annoying particles that get through. And, and they will uh, contribute to this incorrect uh, fraction that is uh, polluting the structure. Uh, but we have to the classification for getting rid of them. So you run uh, one part, uh, particular algorithm. In this case, it was CRISPR. So you get a uh, very nice structure, some classes with uh, very good uh, representatives. You get uh, particles in the in the apertures. That is uh, somehow what you expected, but because there were still a few of them there. And, and then you also get some bad things. So you get only the good, the particles coming from the good classes. And because we are uh, particularly worried about this uh, stability of the parameters and being a, a good particle or not a good particle is also another parameter you have to estimate. Now we use a, a, a different mathematics to uh, classify the particles. So uh, this is CRISPR, this is uh, XMIP. And, and XMIP, only the good particles from CryoSpark, still you see that there were particles with problems uh, that were coming from the, from the uh, aperture. So the, all these bad particles, they were somehow hidden by uh, the good, in the good classes. And this is not any particular criticism to CryoSpark or any good uh, of XMIM. It is the failures of one algorithm will not be the failures of the next one. So uh, you, uh, our suggestion is always to use kind of orthogonal uh, mathematics so that you can identify the false positives and the false negatives of one with 
uh, a different uh, approach. And we are all familiar with this kind of representation, where you start with 1.6 million particles and then you classify into three different uh, 3D classes and then you come out with uh, supposedly homogeneous classes. But this, um, this analysis, typically they are done only one and uh, only once. And, and uh, here is an example, you get this ribosome data and you classify into three classes and then you see, okay, almost two equally populated classes and then some uh, small class here, probably this graph. And, and now you can build your uh, biological story uh, telling the difference between these two classes. Because we were worried about this stability of the parameter determination. We run this classification again with the same algorithm, same uh, reference structure, but because there are some random initialization, you get now a different result. Now three classes equally populated. And now you you don't know which one of the two is the correct story. So you run it a third time. And this third time, you get something similar to classification two. And now you think, okay, the first classification one was a mistake, and classification two and three are consistent with each other. And this is actually not true. Now you can count, you can make subsets of the particles that have been put together all the time in the three classifications. And this is what you get. So you get a whole continuous continuum of, of particles. So uh, estimating the, the class uh, is also a very unstable process. And uh, you need to run things multiple times and to see uh, ideally with different algorithms to make sure that what we are reporting is actually what is in the data. The same happens with the angular assignment. So the angular assignment, um, and this extrapolates to many other parameters, we, uh, the, the alignment parameters and the shift, uh, in-plane shift parameters, they can be thought as uh, constructing a model on the number of observations that are the pixels of your image. So we would like to think that, okay, this is a, okay, we have noise, but uh, uh, we can make a decent job. Very often what happens is that this data is very difficult to, to feed. And there are many possible uh, models that more or less are, are compatible with the data. And, and here is an example of the Angular, a comparison of the Angular assignment done with XMIP high res, that is our uh, equivalent to rely on auto refine. And, and then we compare the angular difference for a number of particles for between XMIP and rely on. And you see that for half of them, more or less they agree, and for the other half, they disagree. And this disagreement can go somewhere, depending on the data set, between 10 and 50%. And it is also for the angles, but it, it is also for the shifts. So uh, we don't know which one of the two is, is right, but what we know is that they disagree. So I'm not sure what the true angle is for those particles. And it is not that XMIP and Relion disagree. It is that Relion disagree with itself and, and almost for the same amount of, of uh, the same proportion. And again, it is not a particular criticism of Relion, XMIP, or whatever. It is that we are in a very extremely noisy setup and we can make a lot of mistakes in the estimation of parameters. And we are all familiar with all these kind of, of uh, angular distributions. So uh, uh, this is your map, and then you put a, a bar with uh, that is more or less high, depending on how many particles are coming from that projection direction. And what we see is that uh, okay, there are some directions that are overloaded, and some other directions that are somehow empty. And we tend to attribute these to the uh, to the preferential uh, interaction between the protein and the water air interface or whatever uh, any other uh, experimental reason which may be true but what is less known is that the algorithm itself can also play a role in creating these asymmetries and, and again this is the same data set processed in two different ways one is rely on the other one is is X -mean. And you see that uh, this, in this case, it is, this is rely on this is excellent. 
And, and you see that the algorithm itself can create these empty regions. So uh, uh, unless you can compare to something else, you can never be sure that your estimates are really what experimentally they have, uh, what you have in the experiment. It could be that the algorithm itself is biased for some reason. And that is uh, something that we call the attraction problem. And the attraction problem is, is uh, that, it's, uh, it is that uh, when a direction or a class uh, starts to get signal to noise ratio, because uh, it, it starts to get a lot of particles, the, the background is average more because you have more particles. And then there is kind of lower barrier and it uh, uh, attracts more particles. So it, it is mathematic, mathematically justified it is in, in this paper. So uh, the conclusions of this first part would be uh, my reconstruction will be a mixture between uh, uh, the, the proportion of particles for which I have done a decent uh, estimate. They don't need to be absolutely perfect, but they are more or less close to the ground truth. And a mixture of uh, particles that are uh, totally incorrect and they are biasing my design, my, my 3D structure. And 3D reconstruction is all about parameter estimation. The only way to guarantee that I have uh, uh, good parameters is by uh, checking the consistency between the alternative estimates. We have been talking about two, but you can make it three times, four times, and check the consistency between all those. And, and then this uh, strategy of putting everything in, and the algorithm will know through the weights, I would say it is rather subjective. And there is a, a longer talk about this topic in, in this uh, link, if you are interested, interested in it. And this is our current situation. So we have, at the MDB, we have structures that, that look like these. Uh, and again, this is not a particular criticism to these people. So, but, uh, so there, there are many structures like this. When you take that data and you reprocess the same data, but you reprocess taking, putting all the checks that we have been discussing before, then this is what you get. And, and you see that the two structures are what are different. So uh, to try to solve this, what we have set up is a, is a server in which we have put together all the, uh, all the methods that we know for validating the structures. So the idea is that you can uh, submit your, your uh, uh, structure, the, the two half maps, particles, classes, uh, angles, you can submit whatever you want and whatever you have and uh, check whether there is any pathology, uh, pathology in your structure. And we have uh, structured this server into multiple levels. So the first level is if you only have the map. The second level is if you have half maps. Second, uh, so level zero, zero, level one. Level two, if you have the 2D classes, particles, angular assignment, micrographs and coordinates, the atomic model, and also you can uh, add your workflow or you can compare it to other techniques. So the, the least complete uh, validation report is just uh, level zero. That was the, the state of the EMDB up to a few months ago. Now it is compulsory to go to level one where you have also to report the two half maps. But the most complete report includes all of them, all these levels. And this is the kind of, of result that you get. So, for instance, when you only have the map, so there are a lot of things that you can check. For instance, you can check that the map is at the more is well centered, that it has uh, enough space around. Because uh, to correct for the CTF, you need uh, around 30, 40 instruments on each side to, to make a proper correction. Uh, you can also analyze the mask. So. Uh, uh, user is typically given a threshold. So are there connectivity problems in this, uh, uh, on the mask under this threshold? Uh, you can also check the background. All algorithms are assuming, all reconstruction algorithms are assuming that the, the background has zero mean. Is it true? You can check the B factor. You can check the, the resolution by algorithms that do not need the two half maps. You can check that the hand is correct. 
And, and then you will get a report, this is a PDF, that uh, tells you, okay, for these two uh, tests, uh, it is okay. But the background, there is a problem. There are a couple of warnings, and then you can look at the warnings and see, okay, the background is not zero mean, and uh, there is a significant proportion of outliers. And then you can go back to your map and decide whether the report is correct or the report is crap and it has misunderstood your map. That could also be the case. So it is uh, another algorithm. So at the end, it will have its own problems. And then deep rest, for instance, here, it is complaining that the resolution that you are reporting is particularly low compared to the uh, histogram of local resolution. And, and then uh, when you give the two half maps, the typical thing is to look at the FSC, which is fine. It is a global resolution uh, measurement, but there are many other uh, global resolution. For instance, here, the permutation test that I see that uh, you don't have to define what is the threshold uh, for the FSC, but it is somehow statistically determined based on the noise that is seen in the map or you have a uh, local resolution uh, stuff. You have also directional resolution algorithms. Um, yeah, the, all these are uh, directional resolution. And then most of them are fine with the map, but two of them, they complain. And they complain again that uh, the reported resolution is at one of the extremes of the local resolution uh, histogram. And the other one is complaining that the resolution is not uh, uniform in all directions. And then you may go back to your data and see if you have any particular problem or if you like it as it is, even uh, the, the, despite the fact that you know that it has some limitations in, in the final structure. And then uh, if you add to the classes, then we can check the consistency between reprojections from the map and the reprojections of the the 2D classes uh, or the 2D classes you have provided, then if you give us the particles, then uh, we can check uh, whether uh, we detect outliers, whether the, the class 2D classes uh, calculated from these particles agree with the 2D classes you have provided. Then uh, if you give us the angular assignment, uh, we can redo an, an angular assignment with uh, well-established methods with rely on crash part, we can compare uh, the assignment uh, of, of these two methods to the assignment that you have provided. And we can also uh, see whether they agree with each other. So uh, maybe you have a difficult problem where uh, particles cannot be well aligned. And then here, uh, for instance, you have the kind of warnings that you get. So the percentage of images with uncertain ship is larger than these, or the same for the, uh, this is when you compare crash park to your angles, and then when you compare reliant crash park, and then you get all kinds of plots in the, in, the, uh, in the report. And if you give us coordinates, we can check whether those coordinates are falling in regions of aggregations, in regions with aperture problems or uh, carbon or uh, ice crystals or whatever. Then uh, if you give an atomic model, the, the PDB uh, uh, deposition uh, system is very good in checking uh, the atomic model and uh, in the comparison between the atomic model and, and the cryo map, it is not using many of the uh, of, of some of the methods that are available. Then we have incorporated uh, uh, these into our uh, into our uh, server, and then you get uh, uh, complaints. For instance, this one, the Phoenix again, it is complaining about the resolution. Ian Ringer that uh, the, the score is smaller than one. DAC also is complaining about the its own score. And, and then you can, again, you, you get a lot of uh, feedback about how everything looks like regarding your uh, map and the fit into the atomic model. Then uh, something that we think it is very useful is to report the workflow that you have done. So uh, from the raw, uh, movies to the final structure, you have taken a lot of decisions. So you have decided 
to discard some of the micrograms for whatever reasons, you have decided to uh, choose these particular coordinates and then at uh, these angles and these 2D classes and these 3D classes. So you can record everything and, and you can upload it to some uh, workflow uh, server. So this is the direction of the workflow server. And in the report, you get a, a, a representation like this that is actually not very useful. <laughs> But uh, if you click on the on the on the uh, workflow server, now you can interactively open the workflow and see for each one of the steps uh, which were the data that, that went in, what is the data that went out, what are the decisions that you have taken, what are the parameters with which you have uh, uh, run all these algorithms, and it, it is a very detailed uh, report and. This is only available for Cypium, but it is the software that we develop. But uh, we are open to make it available to anything else. And here is an example of, of three different uh, reconstructions of the same molecule. This is the spike of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. And you see that they all claim kind of similar resolution, 3.3, 3.7, 3.8. Here are the EMDB entries. Uh, but you see that the appearance of those maps are completely different. So here is the an isosurface. Here are some uh, slices. And when you go through the server, you don't have uh, uh, all the information available. But you see that these two, only seven and six tests are passing out of 13. And this one is 14 out of 20. So for this one, th this one is ours. And, and we have a little bit more information. So. That is why we have uh, a few more tests for this. And the report can be rather detailed. So you can see that uh, it goes up to 113 pages. And it is a lot of information, but it can tell you about any, any pathology that you have in your mind. And, and then uh, the last part of the talk will be about trends in, in machine learning as I see them in single particles. And I have collected this information from this wiki that anyone is, uh, is invited to, uh, to register and upload uh, their own methods. And this is a comparison between uh, analytical methods, so those based more on, on classical image processing and those more based on deep learning. You see that the deep learning ones started appearing six years ago, which makes sense. That is when deep learning started to, to, go, uh, to go up. And, but it's still, uh, there are a lot of uh, classical stuff in, in our field. And in terms of number of methods, uh, you see that uh, there have been kind of five different periods. So uh, up to 95, between 96 and 2002, and then uh, up to 2012, a couple of years here, and then it went up, and, and this is where we are now. So the, in single particles, there are really, really a lot of methods, new methods, and, and I think they are uh, pretty useful to uh, validate that what we are uh, getting is actually what you have in the experiment. And here is a, a, the composition of those methods into different uh, different domains. So here you have single particles here. So everything related to single particles. Here you have electron tomography that at the moment it is not uh, as active as single particles. There are many more people working in single particles, it seems. And here, uh, one that is going up very quickly is this uh, sample preparation and image acquisition, and, and then all other topics. So uh, this uh, sample preparation and image acquisition, I, I have decomposed into three different subdomains. So image formation, there are a few papers, especially in the last years, trying to understand how the, the images are formed, especially at very high resolution. Image acquisition, again, uh, kind of automation and, and these things, and then sample preparation. So they are pretty active. And this is the all other uh, topics. So this, this domain here, 
that has been uh, uh, decomposed again into 2D crystals, databases, helical, tetrahedral. So you see that uh, at the moment, single particles is still very active. So it is not something that you could say is solved, I would say. And within single particles, uh, I have again decomposed into different uh, uh, subdomains. So one that is very active is at reviews. So there are, I don't know, 10 reviews every year about uh, single particles. Then modeling, that makes sense because now in the last years we are uh, in the two, three answering resolution range. So it makes sense that there are a lot of uh, uh, new algorithms in, in modeling and comparing, uh, computing the, uh, the atomic structure of the old cryo map. Then 3D classification, still very active, especially all the heterogene continuous heterogeneity that uh, Steve has been uh, presenting before. 3D reconstruction is still active, uh, either in the bare form of, of just reconstructing a map or including some constraints or some regularizations. 3D alignment is also uh, relatively active. And the CTF, it seems to be a little bit more calm. And validation, again, a lot of new ways to validate your structure. Uh, 2D pre uh, pre processing, surprisingly, it is, uh, it is not dead. So it would seem that it is uh, at the beginning of the, of the pipeline and no one would be working there, but it is not the case. Particle picking, again, uh, it makes sense. It is uh, we need to find our particles and the best way we can. And new ways are always welcome. Uh, to the classification, software, post processing. That again, uh, it is very active in the last years because once you have your structure, you want somehow to uh, boost the high frequencies and to uh, uh, and to show uh, to highlight those areas that are coming from uh, protein to, and to distinguish them from the areas that are coming from the background. And, and new ways of measuring the resolution, directional resolution and, and local resolution. So with this, uh, I will go to the conclusion. So uh, single particle analysis has to operate in a very, very noisy environment which implies that uh, you will have a small levels for some of the parameters that will be a little bit of variance and a little bit of noise around the ground truth. But then you will also have a fraction for which you will commit big errors. And the only way to identify uh, whether your error is small or big is by comparing those parameters to a kind of equivalent estimate by some other algorithm or at least a second run of the same algorithm with some randomness inside so that you can see whether the parameter that you have got is uh, is a stable or not. And then the fraction of parameters that uh, are totally incorrect, not this one. This one is just a little perturbation on the correct structure. But this one will make a, a, a significant bias into your structure as much as the one that we have shown before with the, with the SPI. And then we should validate our result with as many tools as available, not just the global FSC, which is fine, but it is not the only thing that, uh, uh, available. And, and then part of the information needed to, for others to understand your result and to validate your result is to have the raw data. This, in, in this regard, I would say uh, the field has given a step forward by creating Empire and allowing people to, to upload their data to Empire. However, if you look at the almost a thousand structures that have been published about the, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, proteins, only one, two percent of the data uh, of the data sets are available in, in Empire. So we have a place to, to put the data, but still not, it is not so much used. And something that would be really, really interesting would be to see your uh, image processing pipeline and your decisions, and, and so that the result can be reproduced in some uh, someone else's hands. And, and also, we can find better ways to process the data, the same data, and, and come out with better structures. And with this, I'm finished. And I would like to thank the, the group uh, here in Madrid.
and, and then the, our many collaborators all over the world and the funders. I'm open for your questions.